from Miami Beach. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting for Neurosurgical TV. Uh, we have another interactive neuroendoscopy session with Ashish Tandon, Tandy, Tandon uh, who did a fellowship with, with uh, Charles, Charlie Teo, uh, MD, a neurosurgeon from Australia, who's, who's very well known. Uh, and so uh, we're going to, going to be as interactive as possible. Uh, and Ashish, uh, we have as much time as you want. So if anybody here has questions, don't worry about the time, okay? Take as long as you want. Okay, Ashish, it's all yours. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you, John, once again for having me here. Uh, today, I would be speaking on the minimally invasive uh, approach for management of trigeminal neuralgias. But before I go into the MIS approach, so what personally I do is either, as we all do, medical management, or I go for RF, or I would say uncommonly or now rarely I would do an MVD. But when I do an MVD, I do entirely through a keyhole approach. Uh, through a very small incision, and uh, I love that procedure. But over the last uh, half a decade or so, I have uh, uh, my 80% of trigeminal work would be RF, and just about 10 to 20% would be MVDs. So that's the disclosure I wanted to present. As with my previous uh, lectures, please feel free to interrupt me to ask questions. Uh, you can post your questions on the chat and uh, in, between, um, in between the lecture, I'll stop at important points, uh, important uh, areas, and then I would sort of take up those questions. Uh, so, okay. Right. So the first, is this, okay. Uh, so, uh, there are a few questions. You can answer uh, them if you want to. So, typically, according to Headache uh, uh, International Headache uh, Group, trigeminal neuralgia is classified to, into how many types? So one, two, three, or four. Okay. Uh, this is an important question in relation to RF. Uh, which are the nociceptive nerve fibers in the trigeminal uh, nerve, or for that matter, in the nervous system. I, is it A alpha, beta, delta, or C type? So that's again in relation to the RF. Uh, which artery do you think is the commonest vessel to compress the root entry zone of the fifth nerve? Uh, is it the posterior cerebral artery, the superior cerebellar artery, anti-inferior cerebellar artery, or the posterior inferior cerebellar artery? Anybody wants to take that question? Somebody needs to answer it. Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. Just introduce yourself. Sir, and uh, Ninad, sir. Oh, hi, Ninad. Yes, sir. Yeah, tell me. Sir, uh, SCA. The superior cerebellar artery. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, any major vessel that I have missed in these four? Sir, uh, hello, sir. Uh, it's Dr. Shahnawaj uh, from yeah. Bangladesh, sir. Yeah, hi, Shahnawaj. Uh, sir, uh, you have mentioned the important vessel, but maybe uh, in a rare situation, uh, some important veins also may cause. Oh, the yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. Veins are very, very and crucial, very important. Yes. And sometimes, if there is a uh, doliquitative and tortuous basilar artery, it perfect. May also cause. Perfect, perfect. So, uh, I think uh, um, absolutely correct answers by both of you. Okay. Now, true and false. Most frequent 
So trigeminal neuralgia is most frequent amongst elderly males. True or false? Okay. I have seen this disease mostly with the female, but uh -huh. I don't know. Correct. correct. Again, correct. Even if you have not read, this is by experience and you are absolutely correct. It's more common amongst elderly females. Okay. This is an important, very, very important question. Trigeminal neuralgia pain is worse at night. True or false? Uh, sir, so far, the trigger is the concern. Maybe it's a false statement. Uh, a anybody wants to who wants to contradict Shanavas? What's your opinion, Ninad? Sir, mainly it is uh, triggered by uh, external stimuli like uh, air waves or. Uh, so, like no, but, so the question is whether the pain is worse at night or not. No, 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 sir. It's not. What about you, Redab? What do you feel? Uh, I think, uh, yes, it has to do with the night or day night is for external stimulations like um, um, whether the cold or chewing or sore um, sensation. Yeah, they, or they are triggers. I agree. I agree to all three, but is the pain worse at night? Yes or no? No. Good. So all of you are absolutely correct. It's very clear. Trigeminal neuralgia pain. Surprisingly, the patient will not suffer from pain once the patient is asleep or in at night. However, uh, having said that, I would say that there are a uh, good number of uh, publications which say that even at night, the patient may have pain, you know, at night while sleeping, you know, there may be stimulation or some trigger. But yes, the patient has pain more so in the day. Okay, trigeminal nerve is not a pure sensory nerve. True or false? True. Uh, true, sir. Okay. Now, the last question is, identifying vascular compression confirms the diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia. True false. or false? False. Uh, false, sir. False. Radhaab says false. Anybody else? Okay, I, I think uh, absolutely correct. You don't, uh, there may be a lot of instances, and in fact, the uh, Headache Society 3 classification wherein you have idiopathic uh, trigeminal neuralgia, there is no cause, no vascular compression whatsoever. Even uh, after surgery, the surgeon has not found any vascular compression. So it is not necessary to identify a vascular compression to diagnose trigeminal neuralgia. Okay, but before I go on to trigeminal neuralgia, and uh, the management that I would be talking about. I want to quickly take you uh, to the types of facial pain, causes of facial pain. And you know, you should just be aware of all these so that when the patient is sitting in front of you in the OPD, you do not uh, tend to miss the diagnosis because what happens typically is that the patient would come from a dentist or an ENT specialist and the dentist would have said to him or her that, look, you have trigeminal neuralgia, you go to the ex-doctor. And so mentally, when you're sitting in the OPD, you, you sort of uh, get into that, uh, uh, you know, you get swayed by, uh, by what the uh, referring doctor has written. So you should always consider differential diagnosis uh, because as you know that it is more of a clinical uh, diagnosis. So the causes of facial pain could be infectious, neurological, vascular, oncological, or psychogenic. Okay. Now, uh, the differential for herpes, uh, generally the patient comes with severe V1 territory pain. Okay. And 
uh, it is uh, difficult to um, uh, miss it because of the vesicles. But in the initial stage of herpes or say in, in a stage of post herpetic neuralgia, you may think it as trigeminal neuralgia. So herpes zoster, all types of dental diseases can uh, mimic like trigeminal neuralgia. Certain orbital lesions, intracranial tumors, these can all uh, mimic like uh, neuralgia. So uh, let's see the extracranial lesions. We need to rule out sinus disease. So it could be infective or neoplastic lesions of uh, the paranasal sinuses. As I've already told you, various types of dental pain. Uh, they could be dental caries, dental extraction. So in case, uh, if you are in doubt, just take a help of a dentist to rule out any dental disease. Uh, temporomandibular joint pain can again mimic like uh, neuralgia. So uh, you have to uh, think uh, about that as well. Uh, a quick word on glossopharyngeal neuralgia. Uh, again, as with trigeminal neuralgia, we do not know the exact cause. It's, common, it's equal amongst uh, both the genders. But the pain is more so in the tonsillar area or the ipsilateral ear. The pain is severe for one to two hours and it generally recurs. Uh, the treatment is more so like trigeminal, but the medical treatment is not very good. Okay, so uh, again, post herpetic neuralgia, I've already talked about more so in the V1, but at times you may have it in V2 and V3 areas. Uh, if you have post herpetic neuralgia, you treat it generally the same drugs are used as for trigeminal, so carbamazepine, but tricyc uh, sorry, amitriptyline is one of the drugs that is used apart from carbapentine and uh, pregabalin. Okay, so uh, the next disease that you need to consider is atypical facial pain. So th this is my my dictum. For all the patients of trigeminal neuralgia, please stop for 30 seconds and ask yourself why this patient is not atypical facial pain. Because suppose you take up the case and then you treat and if it turns out to be atypical facial pain, I'll tell you, this would be the most difficult patient in your clinic. Totally dissatisfied, highly complaining, lot of cognitive issues, so please, it's better to miss a few neuralgia rather than treat atypical facial pain surgically, okay, or by any intervention. Now, how does an atypical facial pain present? The pain is felt over the cheek, nose, upper lip. And it's more generalized. It could be bilateral. So unlike trigeminal, uh, which is in 98% of cases, it is unilateral. The the pain is aching, shooting, uh, burning, dysesthetic, and there could be a lot of lacrimation from the eyes, ear, uh, nose. It, it, it does not uh, wax and wane. It may remain continuous for hours, days, weeks, and obviously there are a lot of psychological component to it. The patient has, multi has had multiple consultations, so on and so forth. Uh, so generally females, again, middle-aged or older, so that is very similar to trigeminal neuralgia, but the pain is constant. Okay. Now, here I would like to emphasize that, you know, now trigeminal neuralgia type 2 is a pain which is, which is constant and burning. So it is not necessary to have those uh, sharp shooting, lancinating pain in all the cases. That is very typical of trigeminal neuralgia one. So elderly female, again, constant pain. So very similar to trigeminal neuralgia, but this is poorly localized. This is very important. It may cross the midline, 
Uh, again, the patient uh, sleeps well most of the time, but not necessarily. Uh, again, no objective signs investigations are negative, but the, this type of patient would have other symptoms as well. Okay, so uh, please don't miss idiopathic facial pain or uh, atypical facial pain. This I have already talked about. Okay. A uh, few other uh, would be maxillary sinusitis. Just look for tenderness. This is one of the facial pains where you have uh, uh, positive signs and when you get an x-ray or a CT or even an MRI, it would be very clear. Nasopharyngeal carcinoma is another of the diagnosis. But Apart from maxillary pain, the patient also may suffer from numbness because of involvement of the maxillary division. Okay, so this is another diagnosis that you need to consider. And then post-traumatic neuralgia, that could be uh, pure trauma or secondary to a procedure. Uh, then at times, uh, you also need to consider uh, certain types of headaches like temporal arthritis, which may also mimic like uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Okay. I'll skip this. Okay. Now, this is an important question. In a primary care setting, or suppose if you are the first physician uh, and... Uh, so how much percentage do you think uh, history has in making a diagnosis? Uh, then uh, what about uh, examination and what about investigation? So in 100 cases or in say in a particular case, to what percentage do you think the diagnosis is made just by history? Anybody? Take a wild guess, doesn't matter. Uh, so I I'll answer this. And so history is the most important in trigeminal neuralgia. So take your time in your OPD, sit, think of each and every point, ask for triggers, ask for duration, ask for waxing and waning, then sites, it's very important to ask for the site, whether is it going below the angle of the mandible, is it going posterior to the V1 area, is it bilateral, you know? So just need to find out, you need to tell yourself that, look, this is not neuralgia, trigeminal neuralgia. And keep on asking yourself, because to make a diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia, it's all about history. In very few percentage, you have physical examination or investigations, okay? So if there is secondary trigeminal neuralgia, then obviously investigations help. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, trigeminal neuralgia is recurring paroxysmal, severe, sharp shooting pain. Pain which is one of the most severe uh, uh, human being suffers from. It is very brief. Now, when I say brief, it could be seconds to minutes. Okay, generally speaking. If it is a long-standing neuralgia, these patients may get converted, as I have already told, to constant pain as well. Now, this dura brief duration pain is uh, in the territory of certain specific dermatomes. So it could be V1, V2, V3, or a combination, or all three. This pain may or may not have trigger, but generally they have triggers, and the triggers could be anything related to the face. So chewing, washing, talking, a breeze, touching, etc., etc. Okay. So that's very important. So you need to think about 
each and every point of history and then come to a diagnosis. Females are more commonly affected, elderly, as I've already told you. Uh, sleep often is not affected in these patients. We've already answered that. And these patients may go into remission. Okay. Right. Now, uh, I, as I was talking to you about the international classification of headache disorders, they have mainly described three types, idiopathic, where there's no demonstrable a pathology, a classic type where you have a compressing vessel and you have a symptomatic type where, or secondary type where you have tumors or MS or trauma, etc. There's another broad classification which classifies trigeminal neuralgia into almost seven types, you know. Uh, but this is a more easier, simpler classification to remember. <clears throat> Certain important stats, uh, almost 5 to 10 per lakh per year is the incidence. Female to male ratio is approximately 2 to 3 is to 1. And 60% would be either a V2 or V3, V2 being the commonest. And uh, both divisions getting involved would be around 30-35%. The least would be V1. <clears throat> now, what is the pathogenesis? Truly speaking, Till date, we really do not know what the pathogenesis is. So because, you know, doing so many microvascular decompressions, when we remove the compression uh, and the patient gets relieved, we thought, neurosurgeons thought, think that, you know, it is the vascular compression that is the cause, but that's not true because now we know that in a lot of cases, there may not be any vascular compression. Uh, so, uh, then what happens? So, basically, the current theory is that there is an area of demyelination that happens at the root entry zone, and this demyelination causes ectopic uh, release of uh, or ectopic stimulation that leads to pain. Then, something very similar happens when there is a posterior fossa tumor or multiple sclerosis, but multiple sclerosis is also affecting the brainstem. Okay. So, um, let me see. Yeah. yeah, so this is the current uh, theory of, uh, I'm sorry. These are certain brain brainstem plaques. So the current theory is that what happens at the root entry zone is demyelination, and that demyelination is the cause of uh, ectopics and these pains. And vascular compression could be one of the reasons for the demyelination to happen. But then why should it happen more in women and so on and so forth? So anyway, I, I don't think so. I'll go into that. And that is not the purpose of today's lecture. The main purpose of today's lecture is to draw a lot of you into percutaneous uh, procedures or minimally invasive MVTs. The first, uh, uh, these the, I have divided the, the lectures into two. Today, I would be restricting myself to radio frequency or the percutaneous. In my next lecture, I would be talking on the MIS approach to MVDs. Okay, so what treatment options do we have? Uh, we have medical treatment, which is uh, the commonest and it, it is perhaps effective in 60 to 65%. In those who are not able to tolerate or there is a failure, you have the interventional treatment where you have either ablative surgery or non-ablative surgery. In non-ablative physiological surgery, you have the microvascular decompression, which would be the subject of our next lecture. So today I would be talking about the ablative procedures. Okay, so uh, at this point of time, I think I would uh, take a short break if there are any questions or if you want to ask me anything,
uh, I would be more than happy to answer. Uh, sir, uh, may I ask a question, sir? Yes, yes, please, please, please. Uh, suppose uh, we are uh, considering vascular compression as the etiology of the trigeminal neural gear. So, is there any specific MRI sequence that uh, if we follow and we can observe the patient, whether it is compressing the nerve or not? This is number one. And mm -hmm. uh, is there any study uh, or is there any evidence that uh, which uh, branch of the uh, HCA, I mean the caudal or canal branch, or it is the main stain that is causing the uh, trigeminal neural gear as the vascular compression. Okay, so coming to your second question, uh, previously uh, what was happening was that uh, we uh, we thought that uh, there are certain branch or superior cerebral artery is the cause because we tend we saw the nerve from the posterior aspect. So when we went through the retromastoid approach, the we saw it posterior. So whichever vessel was compressing posteriorly, we thought that is the commonest. So it could be SCA or any of the other branches that we have talked, or uh, branch of ICA or you know. But now, uh, after endoscopy and because of our failures, we realized that you know this root entry zone compression could be anterior as well. So the whole concept of which vessel is you need to definitely uh, release or decompress is now out of the box. You need to see all around the artery, uh, all around the nerve, I'm sorry, and decompress. So uh, uh, specifically, whether it is either of the twigs or the, any of the twigs of ICA is uh, it does not hold true anymore now. I think that's the answer to your second question. Your first question was MRI sequences. Yes, we have the TOF sequences. We have there are certain uh, GAD enhanced sequences as well that are used for MRI, and they are they beautifully pick pick up the uh, vascular compression. Secondly, there are certain sequences for MS as well as for tumors, which would tell you the relationship of the uh, tumor with the nerve. So we do have specific sets of uh, sequences. Also, you need to be very sure that when you are looking to this, to these sequences, what happens is at times, a small lesion in the meckel scape can be missed. Okay, so not only you need to have sequences to see vascular compression, but uh, you also need to ask your radiologist that if is there anything happening near and around the meckel scape. So this is to answer your questions. A anybody else? Thank you, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, do we have to ask for uh, MRI brain in each and every suspected patient of TN. Yes, I think so. I would, uh, I personally ask in all because uh, I don't want any surprises later on because two to five percent of trigeminal neuralgias could be secondary to tumors, uh, specifically epidermoid tumors or uh, 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 trigeminal schwannomas. Uh, etc., etc. So, uh, I would not want to miss also a few percentage of patients may just have MS as they're presenting. In, in younger population, 100%. In elderly, also over the last years, I have shifted and I think um, MRI should, because if you are contemplating uh, uh, interventional procedure, uh, you can't miss something. So for me, all cases of trigeminal neuralgia, you need an MRI. Uh, I'm not sure for a certificate for this webinar. So maybe John knows, uh, has the answer for that. Okay. A any more questions? Fine. So 
this this is a small slide about the medical therapy we all know about it i prefer uh, of carbamazepine uh, over carbamazepine but hello hello okay fine so carbamazepine or oxcarbamazepine or still the newer uh, uh, generation carbamazepine group of drug sv carbamazepine can be used uh, my second choice is generally baclofen that is also shown in literature to be very effective the other drugs are gabapentin pregabalin phenytoin uh, and the other drugs but i must tell you uh, the most important and uh, uh, the most effective is carbamazepine group of drug okay now coming to ablative surgery which is uh, the topic for discussion for today the various ablative surgeries uh, include glycerol rhizotomy balloon compression percutaneous radio frequency lesioning which i would be talking about gamma knife peripheral neurectomy uh so let's talk quickly about other procedures so gamma knife uh, therapy well uh, it takes uh, some time uh, for the patient to respond so that's number 1 recurrence rates are always there there are very limited centers for gamma knife and in the long term you may have facial hypoesthesia the relief is lower as compared to rf alcohol injection is one of the last amongst the ablative therapies to be used these days one there is high recurrence it would uh, spread and you cannot uh, be specific uh, the second most common ablative procedure is balloon compression therapy it's very effective but uh, i generally don't use it because of uh, two reasons the first reason is that in all of these patients you need to give general anesthesia and the second is a very thick needle as compared to rf the third uh, reason could also be uh, that the results of rf uh, are better as compared to balloon compression but then balloon compression you don't need a rf device uh, and uh, it, it it could uh, be cheaper as well so and uh, uh, if there is a concomitant involvement of v1 people tend to prefer balloon compression therapy there's another another uh, school of thought wherein in most of these pa of patients of trigeminal they would initially go for a balloon therapy compression therapy if it fails then they uh, use uh, rf if even that fails then they finally go in for glycerol so uh, this was about the other uh, procedures uh, uh, surgical treatment or mvd i would be talking in my next lecture so i would not uh, devote time today so uh, this is uh, the main topic and after a long introduction to the disease uh, i have come here uh, to this topic now what i really want is after today's lecture uh, following is uh, are the points that i would want you to learn one i would want you you to get attracted to this procedure and try it it is truly a minimally invasive uh, a treatment for trigeminal neuralgia though you are not uh, uh, putting knife on the patient but it's truly an mis interventional technique so i want you to get attracted i'll try my best to do that uh the second is i want you to learn how to do the technique and for that i would be speaking about the anatomy about the trajectory of the needles and uh, the uh, the tips and tricks in and out of the procedure so i'll try to be go into as much detail as possible and then finally i would want you to also be aware of what uh, you are entailing into what are the complications what 
what are the results, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so uh, the indications for me for RF, the first and foremost is patient preference, and I'll tell you uh, why I have uh, written this down in red. Previously, you know, before I started RF about 10, 12 years back. I used to treat or I used to operate maybe one MVD in two to three months. So practically in my private practice, I was doing just about four to six or at the most eight MVDs in a year. Now, my uh, uh, procedure, the number of procedures has increased by four folds. And that is all because of patient preference. The minute you give them a non-surgical uh, treatment modality, they sort of grab. So that is one of my foremost indications. The second is failure of medical treatment. So if that fails or there are side effects, then obviously you need to uh, put something more on the table. In aged patients or if there is if there are medical comorbidities, that is RF becomes my first line of treatment after medical treatment. If there is a recurrence after previous MVDs, and specifically, I would choose this for V2, V3 neuralgias. Okay. RF uh, ablation is the most common uh, percutaneous procedure, uh, not just for elderly, but overall. It is a fluoroscopic guided. Mostly, if you fail, then you can try a CT guided procedure. And uh, I'll go into the details of the procedure uh, in a few of the later slides. This is the Gassirian ganglion, and you are sort of ablating it. That is what the procedure is. So now uh, I would go into the detail of the anatomy of the foramen ovale and how to reach uh, to foramen ovale. So what happens is the trigeminal nerve is formed by three divisions, uh, the V1, maxillary, uh, V3, or the mandibular. They, uh, they join along with the motor division. They form a Gasserian ganglia. The motor division continues, and they and then from the ganglia, you have this second order neuron entering into the pons. So the uh, mandibular division enters through the foramen ovale. Uh, then uh, in front, you have the foramen rotundum and the superior orbital fissure from where the uh, V1 enters. Okay, this is the endocranial view. Okay, so I'll try to give you a 3D view because finally you have to enter through the foramen oval to <coughs> stimulate or ablate or do the rhizolysis. So if you see here, this is the foramen oval. The foramen rotundum is in front and the superior orbital pressure is still in front. The Meckel's cave is somewhere here. This is an important radiological structure, the cella, because you need to uh, sort of, you identify the foramen ovale looking to the cella and the petrus. So please note the relationship of the foramen ovale with the cella and the petrus apex. This is the exocranial view. Okay, so the view from outside. Now what I've want you to uh, notice is here you have the foramen ovale okay it is just i would say in line posterior to the dentures okay and again in line with the external auditory meatus fine posterior to that this is very important is the foramen lacerum and the carotid canal. So you have important uh, uh, vessel posterior to foramen ovale. 
And then still behind you have the jugular fossa and the venous drainage. So this is the exocranial view. Now, see, this is the most important view in, uh, in terms of complication avoidance. Because finally, you are coming, your needle is coming from here and going here. And it is entering here. Okay. Now, what are the structures or the contents? So you have the mandibular nerve. In this uh, diagram, it's shown that it's in the center, but it's little laterally located within the foramen cuvae. You have emissary vein and you have the accessory meningeal artery, Post, uh, also the lesser petrosal nerve. Posterior to that, you have the middle meningeal artery and still behind would be the carotid. Again, uh, uh, exocranial view. So uh, again, I'll go into the procedure in detail, but your needle is coming from here and entering here. Okay. So you don't want to go too back. Otherwise, there is a chance of injuring. Okay. I will tell you specific points on radiology through which there is hardly any chance of injuring these important structures. Okay. Now, this is the lateral view. Just imagine an X-ray. So on the X-ray, lateral X-ray, what all you need to see? You need to see the anterior cranial fossa or the floor, the cella. The petrus would be somewhere in this region, the heart palate. Okay. Uh, so this is the lateral view. And your needle, your needle is going to go in this direction. Okay. So what all you need to note is one, it's relation with the heart palate. You will not find this in any book, any chapter, anywhere. What I want you to remember is that in the posterior one third of the heart palate, because that is the first structure that you're going to see on an X-ray as the needle is entering. So you need to be in the posterior one third of the uh, heart palate. Number two, there is a line uh, joining the lower part of or the floor of the cella with the clivus. So under no circumstances are you going to go ahead of that. Okay, you're going to injure important neural structures. So this is the final limit. Okay, the foramen ovale is somewhere located here. Okay. The other important thing that I would want and I would show you in the position is try to see an X-ray something like this and not like this. So when you're positioning the patient, see that the patient is, you know, as straight as possible and not like this. I'll show you uh, some X-rays. Okay. So let's see this beautiful uh, uh, video showing the foramen. So you see, this is, these are the dentures. This is the mandible. You are, you're having the foramen. So don't try to take your needle outside of the mandible. It has to go just medial to the lateral pterygoid plate and medial to the uh, mandible. This is on the opposite side. Okay. Sorry. Okay, okay. Now see, the, another important thing that I would want you to understand is your needle is starting somewhere from here and it has to go. There's a small one centimeter area through which the needle has to go and then it has to come here. The other thing that I would want you to note is look at the relationship of the orbit and the foramen ovale. Okay. Look at the relationship of the zygoma and the external ear and the foramen. Okay. Now, some more anatomical details that I would want you all to understand is, this is the mandibular division. You are entering into the foramen ovale and then into the uh, Gesserian ganglia or the Meckel scale. Here, you, as you go higher, as the needle goes higher inside, the higher the chance of injuring V1 or not able to treat 
V2 uh, nerve if that is the if if that is the area of pain. So suppose if the pain is V3 and if you go very high, then you will not be able to treat that patient. So you should exactly know anatomically where to place your needle. Though stimulation is a big, uh, um, I would say, mm, you know, stimulation is a big means through which you can prevent uh, any uh, mistake. Okay. Now look at the ganglion again. Here, this is the incisors and the canine. Your needle would be somewhere here. It is going to enter, enter into the foramen ovale, getting into the gasserian. If you go higher, you attack V2. If you go still higher, you attack V1. If you remain lower, V3. Okay. Uh, so this is again about the gasserian ganglia. Okay. Now on to the technique of radio frequency lesioning. So what all do you need? You need a RF generator, you need a fluoroscopy, and you need, I use an uh, anesthetist. It sort of, I'm more comfortable with an anesthetist around <coughs> rather than, rather than uh, my anesthesia nurse giving the medications. Okay. Now positioning, how do I position my patient? So the patient is supine. I keep a small, um, uh, uh, sort of support been under the shoulders and just give wild extension, neutral, mild extension. This is the position. So you see there is uh, some support beneath the, uh, uh, in between the scapular blades or the shoulder blades, and there is mild extension. The other thing that I would want you to observe is look at the position of the uh, C-arm receiver. Generally, what we tend to do is we keep it little lower and lower down. So towards the foot and lower down. No. If you have to see the heart palate, if you want to see the cella, you need to keep it up and more towards the vertex. Fine. That is one of the tricks of CM placement. Now look here. Anterior cranial base as much straight as possible. The cella should be very sharply delineated. The clivus should be a straight line. But the most important is there should be no parallax of the anterior cranial base. Okay. So for that, what you need to do is either turn the head like this or like this or like this or like this. You understand? So either the head is turned like this or like this or like this or like this. To get this picture, getting this picture is very important. Now understand what all structures I have to see on my CR. Number one, I want to see the heart palate because as I have told you, if you want to reach somewhere here, your needle needs to be around the uh, posterior part of the heart palate. Okay. The second thing that you need to see is the petrous temporal and you don't need to go above this clival line. This is the absolute top. Okay. Right. So how do I mark? Generally, what you do is you mark 2.5 to 3 centimeter lateral to commissura labialis. So from here, straight line about, as you see, 2.5 centimeters. In my practice, what I do is I just see the outer canthus. Because, you know, at times the patient is fat, male patient is different, 0.5 centimeters is nothing. So what I do is I use the lateral canthus as my uh, lateral uh, end so from the uh, uh, commissura labialis. So th that's number one. So that is what I'm trying to show here. So I go just at the lateral canthus. Okay. Then after that, uh, please notice that I keep a finger in lateral to the dentures and medial to the mucosa. So I can feel the mucosa. Okay. And then I am infiltrating. Okay. Just, just local anesthesia. 
The needle that I use is a 22 gauge needle, 10 or 15 centimeters. So I use a non-disposable electrode. So when I'm using a non-disposable electrode, many a times I find that, you know, my 10 centimeter electrode is not working now. So I have 10 as well as 15 centimeter needle and electrode. Okay. The active tip or the non-insulated tip is five millimeters. Now look here, this, this tip, this needle is completely insulated except the end. This last five millimeter is the active tip or the non-insulated tip, which is going to generate the heat or which will pass on the heat uh, to the surrounding structures. Okay. Now, this is the needle trajectory. So I have one finger inside and the trajectory of the needle. So the needle is going, my finger palpates the last molar or just behind that. And the needle is going within the cheek, not penetrating the mucosa at any point, medial to the mandible, fine, and the needle is going in. Okay, so this is the trajectory. This is the typical trajectory. And if you look here, uh, I had already shown you in that video that look at the relationship of the orbit and the foramen ovale. Okay, so generally speaking, my needle, I, the trajectory is just medial to the pupil. If the patient is looking straight, just medial or towards the inner canthus. That's it. So that is the trajectory I'm going into. Okay, now look here. The needle has gone first posterior to the uh, heart or near to the posterior part of the heart palate. Petrus gone through the foramen ovale, but not passing beyond the clivus. Then I also use AP, not AP, I rather use oblique submental view. An oblique submental view is taken with a AP, then you tilt, you tilt the uh, firing part of uh, the, uh, or the collimator end of the C arm towards the chest and the receiver towards the occiput and you tilt it towards the side from where you're going. So that will give you the oblique submental view and there you will see the foramen ovale. Okay, so this is the picture you will typically get. This is the AP view. So just remember AP submental at times it would be very difficult for you to identify foramen ovale on submental or AP view. Okay, once the needle is about to enter the foramen ovale, in fact, just before that, it is going to touch the mandibular nerve because the mandibular nerve is going in. So you touch it, you know, and the minute you touch it, the patient starts moving. You, once you are near the foramen ovale or entering in, give a test stimulation. There would be a muscle contraction. I'll show it to you in one of the videos. After that, you give a 50 hertz, one millisecond stimulation and there will be paresthesias in the dermatome which is being stimulated. So look here. So here the patient is conscious and yeah, as I stimulated, you saw the jaw opened up. Okay. And then you continue with the continuous stimulation. Okay. Now I'll show you the complete video of how I do. Uh, if you want, I'll show these videos again and again till you understand the whole uh, procedure. Okay. So my finger is inside. Here you will observe Here you will observe that the needle is going inside. The CSF is now coming out, though it is not a must, but generally once you are inside the uh, Meckel's cave, there'll be CSF coming. Once you're sure, you put in your electrode 
and then you do stimulation okay so the stimulation when you are doing stimulating the jaw tends to open or the patient will tell yes that you are the the paresthesia is there in the same area where she has pain okay once that is done you shift from stimulation to continuous now you see my machine i'm sorry okay here now see this machine i'm sorry again not able to see the bar okay here we go okay here you see i have set it to 70 degree centigrade for 60 seconds this is the impedance continuous lesioning and this is the temperature so temperature impedance this is my setting this is the machine i am giving a continuous lesion the others are pulsed rf stimulation okay so as you see the time is uh, every second it's going and there's a temperature change finally the temp the electrode tells me the temperature of the electrode okay so i had set 70 degrees and i have achieved 70 degrees here the total stimulation time is now 50 seconds and it's sort of going on so whatever time i set i generally set 65 or 70 degree centigrade for 60 seconds okay that that is what uh, i do so look at my machine here uh, i have a thermocon uh, it has pulse lesioning i hardly use it uh, pulse lesion is done at 42 degree centigrade but uh, results are not very good uh, i i've stuck to continuous lesion this is stimulation and if you press impedance it will tell you the impedance the importance of impedance is when you have a impedance of more than 500 or 600 then your current flow is not very good here you have the temperature setting and the time setting so through these i do the setting or my assistant does the setting and then we go ahead okay uh post procedure instructions are antibiotics for a day carbamazepine to gradually withdraw and discharge after 4 hours okay now uh, i'll again open up uh, the session for questions especially for the procedure uh if you have any questions please unmute yourself uh, regarding the technique or you know anything that you want to ask hello feel free feel free to answer, uh, ask any question hello hello sir yes hi piggy go ahead anybody yeah uh, sir uh, can, uh, are you using plain needle or the curved one rf needle let hello we, uh, there's one question from dr ratnani when we call there is failure of medical management well failure of medical management is uh, when either the patient continues to suffer from pain and there is hardly any response or a suboptimal response <coughs> that is failure second is if you have a uh, lot of side effects because of the drug so the patient says that you know i keep on sleeping i have hardly any quality of life left lot of complications uh, uh, mm, Uh, and when you withdraw the medication the patient does not he still continues to suffer so that is sort of a failure to uh, failure of medical management that was one of the questions a any more questions hello uh, yes go ahead go ahead amir go ahead yes hello regarding the technique uh, i Uh, thank you for your uh, uh, presentation about RF. Uh, and uh, I have a question about uh, the nature. If anybody of... wants me to repeat any part, I, I am free to do that. No, no. Uh, oh. I wanted to ask about. Uh, take your time. Take your time. Then 
the nature of uh, the uh, waves that you enter to the okay so then give me a feedback have you all understood no no I, I'm, I'm i'm sorry uh, Ash, ashish i don't think you're hearing a mirror are you hearing a mirror yes 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 sir yeah i hear you a mirror have you all understood the technique yeah, Ashish, could you could you understand the Don't question of unmute the mirror? yourself? He, uh, he is unmuted. <laughs> go ahead, go, try again, uh, Amir. Uh, okay, try again. Okay, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah, you. yeah. Yes, uh, Doctor, I have a question about uh, the nature of the waves that you enter the uh, nerve. Okay. Uh, you said that the base uh, of that is thermal, yes? Thermal uh, degree is entered to the nerve. But uh, uh, at the first of your uh, presentation, you said that uh, RF, uh, and uh, there is a vibration at the tip of the needle, okay? No, there's no vibration. There is thermal uh, radio. Basically, radio frequency waves uh, are... Uh, high frequency waves uh -huh. which uh, cause thermal injury but uh, we have uh, scientific evidence that they specifically affect more of C fibers and A delta fibers in the nerve. So practically uh, uh, it is affecting these are the two nociceptive carrying nerve fibers. The uh -huh. A delta, which are a little larger size fibers as compared to C fibers. C fibers are a little smaller and they, uh, the, the, uh, the velocity is a little slower in C as compared to A delta. So these RF waves are affecting these type of nerves more rather than the mechanoreceptors or the uh, 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 touch fibers. So th that is why RF is used for uh, RF rhizolysis. Again, that is specifically the reason why RF is also used for endoscopic transparamnal surgery where you have a lot of nerves nearby, you know, so that you do not cause numbness, you do not cause dysesthesia. Something very similar for trigeminal neuralgia or for, for that matter for facet joint blocks. Did that answer the question, Amir? No, thank you, thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, sir, can I ask you a question? Sir? Of course. Yes, please, please. please. Uh, just for uh, my clarification, uh, excellent technique you have described. Sir, uh, just two points. Sir, when I'm introducing needle uh, on the uh, lateral view, so should, should the needle be uh, within the posterior one third of the heart pellet or just uh, at the posterior margin of the heart palate. Okay. Uh, so uh, that's a good question. And that is why, uh, see, I showed you this uh, view. Okay. I'll show it to you once again. Now look here. So uh, there are three points. One is the entry point. The other is the point near the clivus. And the third point is somewhere in the heart palate. So oh, where exactly you would be would depend on the extent of, ext extent of extension that you are giving. So suppose if your patient is too flex or extended, then this point will vary. So that is why we have noticed that I can't tell you specifically one point. Rather, it is the posterior one third. Now, why posterior one third? Again, <laughs> if you want, there have been uh, reports in the literature that people have entered into the inferior orbital uh, fissure. That is because if you are too anterior in the heart palate, it is very easy for you to go inside. On the other hand, if you are going posterior to the heart palate, too posterior, then you would hit the 
uh, internal carotid artery, foramen lacerum, jugular. So that is why this for me acts as a safety net. So the first safety net is this area and the sa second safety net is the clavicle line. If I am within this area, I am not going to injure. So suppose if your uh, needle is hitting some bone here, <coughs> you are not going to cause any complication. But if your needle is started, it, it sort of hits somewhere here, there is a good chance that you may injure middle meningeal or you may injure uh, the carotid. So one is this line, second is this, try not to go posterior to this. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, okay. you're welcome. Okay, uh, uh, Ashish Pinky Ratnani has a few questions. Do you want to ask him directly, Pinky? Are you there, Pinky? Yes, yeah, sir. Hello. Yeah, go ahead, Pinky. Ask your questions. You have a couple. Yeah, uh, sir. I want to ask whether you use straight or curve RF needle for your procedure. Okay, I use. Um, um, I tend to use more of straight. Uh, rather than curve, one mainly because of the cost constraint. Uh, curved electrodes have a shorter life; they're difficult to get uh, as far as non-disposable are concerned. And okay. now I have understood that you know, looking to the anatomy of the Gesserian ganglia, if you are a little higher up, you are hitting V2. If you are a little mm -hmm. lower down, you are hitting V3. That is number one. Number two, am I there? Yes. Yes. Sir. Yes. Sir. Okay. Yeah. Number two is that if I am going a little medial, if my needle entry is a little medial, so rather than entering three centimeters, if I am entering two point five centimeters, then there is a good chance to hit V two more easily. So I compensate for the uh, lack of the curved electrode to the change in uh, trajectory and anatomy. Okay. But yes, I in a few cases, I have used uh, curved as well. But now I have uh, come back to the straight. Okay. Uh, sir, my other question is like uh, in medical management uh, for baclofen, how much maximum dose can we use? Okay. See, uh, as far as uh, uh, maximum dosage is concerned in trigeminal neuralgia, I think most of you would have experienced what I have also seen that, first of all, even for carbamazepine and for gabapentin, their tolerance after a certain point is very poor. So whether you're using okay. Zentretard, um, um, at times they're not even able to tolerate 200 milligram twice a day. <laughs> Unlike or pregabalin of uh, 50 milligram or 75 milligram BD, or for that matter, baclofen of uh, uh, not more than 30 to 60 milligrams. So the trick here is that start with a low dose and then gradually jump the dose, be it for carbamazepine, pregabalin, or baclofen. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. So, uh, I had one question to all the participants. Uh, and the question is, how many of you do you think or uh, are you convinced that you will try this technique or at least use it? Um, well, um, thank you, sir, first for the great presentations and the good um, way of explanation. Uh, I may answer my, your, your questions by another question. I was about to ask you um, what exactly the most important factor it depends on the patient. And you said that this patient exactly would benefit from radio frequency, but nothing else, or even more than the um, chemical or the balloon compressions or the NVD. So because uh, according to my, to my um, experience, I know that radio frequency is the one um, that's associated with the highest rate of complications like dysthesia or the recurrence rate or so what exactly sir that it depends on to say that this case would benefit more from radio frequency okay 
So, Perfect. yeah. So, uh, first of all, amongst the uh, ablative procedures, as I have told you, the highest success rate is of RF. The highest rate of complication is with alcohol lesioning. That's number one. The highest recurrence is also of glycerol. The lowest recurrence is with RF. The advantage of balloon is that you can try in V1 as well. Because it does not cause a lot of corneal anesthesia. Okay, so for me, uh, I would, uh, uh, as I started with my disclosure, <coughs> if the patient asks me, even if he is 50, 60 years old, no comorbidities, I would offer RF to him or her. If he says that, look, uh, I'm not ready to accept a higher recurrence that uh, is with RF vis-a-vis -vis MVD. So the initial success with RF and MVD is same, but the long-term recurrence is higher with RF rather than MVD. So if he is not ready to accept that, then in that case, I would offer him a microvascular decompression. Secondly, I will offer a MVD if two or three sessions of RF have failed or there is a recurrence. So th those are the general indications for me. Sir, uh, long term means how much in an average? Yes. Okay, so uh, okay, so let me show you. Let me talk about the complications and the result. So in complications, you can have facial hematoma. You can have injury to the surrounding structures like carotid or orbital structures. You can have aseptic meningitis. You can have bacterial meningitis. Facial numbness is 5%. I mean, long-term facial numbness. Short-term facial numbness is is quite often in cases when you give temperature of 70 degrees. If you reduce it to 60 degrees, it's a little less. Chewing difficulty because of masseter weakness is about 4%. Corneal anesthesia is just about 1%. Dysesthesia, anesthesia, dolorosa, about 0.5%. Now results, more than 90% patients would have initial relief following RF trisolysis. <coughs> so, there are papers who have suggested that RF has a success rate even up to 98%. So it, is, it has a very high success rate. In my series of patients, um, I have had just one patient, a young male, he is a police officer, who did not have relief um, after RF. Rest, I'm not talking about recurrence, but rest, all of my patients out of the OT, this, they have had a great significant relief with RF. So um, I, I can vouch that more than 90% of your patients would have initial relief. Now, as far as recurrence rate is concerned, in uh, RF, you have a recurrence of 15 to 20% at one year. Vis-a-vis -vis MVD, which is about 10 to 12%. Uh, as I've already mentioned, it has the best of results for interventional pain therapy. Now, when I talk about long-term result, and this, this was what your question was, the long-term results of MVD are definitely better than RF. Okay, so this is at six to 10 years. So at six to 10 years, MVD would have a recurrence of about 20 to 30 percent, whereas RF would have a recurrence of 25 to 40 percent. So by that, what I mean is at six to 10 years, there'll be only 60 to 65 percent of your patients who would be either completely off medications or relieved with some medications in RF. In MVD, about 70 to 75% or about 70% of your patients would be uh, relieved with either without medications or with medications. So again, if you have questions, 
you're free to ask them. Am I there with all of you? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yeah. Sir, so can I ask you a simple sure. question? Of course. Yes, yes, why not? Sir, um, from the entry point, while proceeding to our trajectory, can you describe that what kind of feeling you are, what, what kind of the feel you are feeling into the needle while proceeding towards the trajectory? From your okay. experience, please. Okay, yeah. So, um, uh, John, can I share my screen once again? Yes, of course. Yeah, okay. So, uh, let me show you through this X-ray. Okay, so when you are somewhere around here, you will hit the mandible. Okay, so that is the first point of bony contact. If you are a little lateral, you're hitting mandible. Okay, so and also the, you will not be able to feel the needle very well. So suppose if this is the needle, this is the needle, you won't be able to feel the needle very well under the mucosa. And it is hitting the mandible. That is the first impact. Then you tilt it, you go in. Now when you go in, again at this point, you will start feeling bone. Okay. And for that, I'll take you to this photograph. I'll take you to this photograph. Now, as you're coming from here, you would be hitting bone here, around here, you know. But the minute, again, I'll take you to this. The minute you are around the nerve, you will feel a softness, a firmish feel and then you would be able to enter. It's very similar to what you feel when you are entering into the foramen in a transforaminal surgery if you have done that. Uh, or uh, I would say when you are uh, injecting, uh, uh, if, when you are giving an intramuscular injection into the gluteal muscle, a little more firm than that. Thanks a lot. Uh, sir, uh, after uh, um, piercing the needle through the mucosa, how many times you take a shots means uh, till uh, till reach the foramen uh, Well, uh, you don't pierce the mucosa because once you pierce the mucosa, your needle gets contaminated because it has entered into the oral cavity. So at no point will you pierce the mucosa. Okay. Okay. So when my hand finger is inside the mucosa the needle has to be always in the muscular layer or beneath the mucosa if it pierces you throw away that needle you take a fresh needle so so never pierce the mucosa that's yes. the one but two is uh, uh, coming to your question which was uh, how many shots well okay uh, see uh, uh, how do I answer this question? I'll answer this question uh, using this x-ray. Now see, why is it called foramen ovale? It is called foramen ovale because of the shape. Fine. Now, this foramen ovale is not always ovale. It can be circular. It can be a thin streak. There could be a bar. There is a very good paper, I think, which was published in 2017 or 18 in uh, uh, ACTA, wherein uh, they studied the, the anatomy, uh, the cadaveric anatomy of foramen ovale. So why I'm bringing this is, if in about 10 to 15% of patients, you will have difficulty in getting into the foramen. Now, in those 10, 15, 20% of patients, your shots would be higher. Okay, that is number one. In your early learning curve, it would be higher. Okay, so there is no ballpark figure. At times, I have just had three or four shots and I have, uh, you know, entered into foramen ovale. At times, uh, I have failed uh, even after uh, 30, 40, 50 shots. I have failed and I had to abandon the procedure. 
also uh, this is the time when you you know when you are uh, put, uh, inserting the needle and time and again you are failing this is the time when you really need the submental view okay because you see the foramen ovale and you know you know where the needle exactly is so this is where uh, if you have taken lateral shots you're not going in use submental view and suppose even after that you're failing then uh, either it has to be ct guided get a good ct done see the foramen ovale on ct and then decide whether you want to pursue it further in this next sitting or not sir first shot uh, at what stage you take first shot after how much uh, inserting range uh, i take the first shot uh, shot near the heart palate the first shot okay. is okay. so that is basically if you look see this is the area of the commissura uh, labialis you know between the dentures so right so this these are the upper dentures the lower denture i am starting here so approximately 4 to 5 cm or 4 cm i take a shot okay sir thank you yeah. okay any more questions good so uh, uh yeah any more questions yeah there's no time limit if there's any questions we're going to stay open there's one question yes is there in the, go ahead if, go ahead if you have time about, how about the uh, learning curve raguram teja well uh, uh, dr raguram the learning curve is not very steep it's not at all steep you just need to get hold of uh, a rf machine and a needle it is it is very simple also prior to getting you just go uh, through this lecture maybe two three times and you'll understand if uh, a lot of things which you may not have understood with the first time i have tried to tell you all the trajectories the pitfalls and uh, there are some more good videos which you can uh, search through the net and the learning curve is not very steep it is a very straight forward and i must tell you one of the most satisfying procedures for a neurosurgeon just imagine one of the most severe pain uh, and the patient immediately out of the theater the patient says that you know i have pain from where the needle entered but i don't have neuralgic pain okay um uh, shanavas uh, has asked what is the follow up protocol well the follow up pr protocol is uh, that uh, um, the first time i call them after two weeks uh, and thereafter uh, once in two to three months i i already counsel them that they have to gradually taper their carbamazepine if they do not have complete relief then they can be on a low dose of uh, carbamazepine if i feel that uh, the procedure has failed then i would give them one more try uh, okay the esteemed dr abdal zaidan has a question go ahead yes sir good evening sir yes good evening uh, thank you very much dr ashish as usual you are extraordinary uh, apparently you have um, much much experience than us in this uh, affair Uh, i have a small question only uh, until where you are giving the local anesthesia i mean uh, you are giving the local anesthesia through the whole traject or just in the beginning or uh, you stop giving anesthesia just before the cesarean ganglion when you enter the foramen ovale uh, where exactly you stop giving local anesthesia well because uh, sir i just give anesthesia up to the mandibular area uh, uh, because you mean the, you mean the maxillary area no where the i where uh, i can feel the mandible you know 
the mandibular point. angle. So, the mandibular, yes, ang the mandibular yes, angle. Yes, yes, mandibular angle. So, if you look okay. here, um, yeah, here, yeah. Uh, so uh, just till I am able to feel the, because I can feel this needle through my finger. So, where it is touching the mandibular angle, I'll just give the local till that point. I don't use a long needle because most of it is not under fluoroscopy. So I don't want to sort of injure anything. Okay. Uh, well, uh, we had the habit to go through the uh, full-on project. Uh, uh, we Sorry? put only Sorry? the finger. Uh, I mean, I, I had a small comment and I want you just to correct it or not according to your more experience. Uh, usually we give the, uh, the, we, the tragic to the needle goes uh, directly to the uh, last uh, molar of the upper jaw uh, while I'm feeling it with my uh, finger, not so, allowing the needle to enter the mucosa, but just tangential to my finger, okay? Yeah. And directing to the pupil, uh, because you said you go sometimes more medial, more to the inner canthus. Yes. Uh, we oh. was we was we was we was it was said that don't go to the medial canthus because that can make a more tilt and can exceed it and go uh, more to the pterygoid fossa. Oh, okay. So what yes. do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, basically, when I am uh, going towards the V two, uh, if the patient because that is the commonest area of neuralgia, and V two is medial as compared to V3. Mm -hmm. So what I do is uh, I just feel that if there is V2 pain, I tend to go more towards the medial aspect of the pupil or towards the inner canthus. And it is the trajectory and not like I'm not going directly. So finally, this is the end for me. I will not never exceed this, this point here. But okay, otherwise you will be outside the uh, Michael's the, the verticulum. Sorry. Otherwise, you will be. Uh, otherwise, you'll be outside. I mean, uh, behind yes. the Meckel's cave. Yes. Yes. So, so if if I am within the Meckel's cave, I know that I am within the ganglia. I am not beyond it. So, uh, yes, mid pupillary line is a very good uh, uh, trajectory to enter the foramen ovale. But when you want to go to V two, a little more medial helps. Okay. Do you insist to do this oblique view you are doing to see the uh, foramen ovale all the time, or Never. it's just no, it's no, just no, no no. When I miss, when I miss it, okay, I'm not able to you know get uh, through a lateral. Then I quickly shift to uh, just to avoid too much of radiation. Okay. Last question: If you yeah. entered suddenly by the carotid and you saw that there is plenty of bleeding. Do you have any reaction to do at that time? What's your uh, management for such case? Do you go, do you abort, or do you wait and see? Uh, can you give us your experience about that? Uh, no, I, I don't, I have not had such a uh, instance, but uh, what I'll do is I'll, uh, so no personal experience. Uh, I, what I'll do is I'll uh, review the literature and I'll come back with what the literature says uh, in my next lecture. I'll do that. Okay, we have a couple questions from the panel. Uh, uh, Raghuram Teha asks, immediately post-op, do you continue with carbamazine? Zipine, yeah. yeah, immediate post-op. I generally tend to use carbamazepine uh, because what I've found is uh, these patients are very apprehensive. They are addicted to this this medications and uh, this medication, and it takes at times some time for them to accept that you know they are relieved of pain. Uh, so I tend to tell them that you know you can gradually uh, taper it off, and I don't mind. Uh, and I I have nothing to prove that you know we have to stop it suddenly. So I do tend to sort of continue for a couple of weeks if they are totally pain free. I, Taper it off and stop it. Um, okay, we have a question here from N. Shah. I don't know if he wants to ask directly. Are you there, Dr. Shah? Uh, you certainly can ask Ashish directly. Yes, yes. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Shah. Yes. Go ahead. 
Thank, thank you. I came in late, but uh, I wanted to actually just uh, kind of uh, confirm the concept that in short, you are ablating the nerve via the given approach, which is shown on the screen. So you ablating the nerve, when do you make sure or how do you feel that you adequately ablated the nerve with radio oh. frequency? Yeah. So, uh, see, because the patient uh, is in partial anesthesia, um, so he is not absolutely very sure of the numbness that I have caused many a times. So for me, I will not go beyond. Previously, I used to use three times, but I've had my complications. So I have now come to two two times. That is the maximum uh, amount of uh, short times I would use. So as I showed you in one of the videos that I gave a 70 degree centigrade for 60 seconds. So I will repeat one more shot, but I will not go beyond that. So whether it has ablated or not, I'm not going to use it for the third time in the same sitting. So it's very, and if the patient is not relieved, I'll uh, get her back after a couple of weeks and repeat the procedure rather than causing uh, complete numbness or long-term dysesthesia. Yes. yes, from experience, judgment. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. You, you're welcome, ma'am. Okay, Napoleon Urcuyo asks, what is your opinion of steroids and local anesthesia for pain control? Well, yeah, this is a very, uh, very, very good question. If you uh, ask me pre-procedure, so there is a school of thought who gives local anesthesia, uh, they'll go and do the same thing, give local anesthesia in the ganglion and see for the relief. If the patient is relieved, then they go ahead and do RF. Like we do for facet joints, you know, something very similar. But after the procedure, there is no role of uh, steroids or local anesthesia. The only place where I would use steroids would be if I have caused, if my patient has had uh, aseptic meningitis. And then in that case, I would use. But remember, aseptic meningitis is more common where they are using the dye. Because I don't use the dye, I use just pure stimulation. So I have not had any case of infective or aseptic meningitis in my series. So in my hands, the complications that I have caused, the top is recurrence. The second is uh, facial uh, numbness. Uh, and in one of the patients, I, it, it's been now almost one and a half to two years and still the patient has significant degree of numbness. So that is complication number two. In terms of frequency also, numbness is uh, second. In one of my patients, uh, the patient, I, I have caused corneal uh, uh, hypoesthesia or anesthesia and the ophthalmologist, I have to continuously keep that patient under my follow-up for uh, eye, uh, eye care. There, there have been a good number of my patients who have told me after the surgery about um, chewing difficulty and weakness of the masseter muscle. But uh, in most of my patients with this complaint, uh, they have recovered within uh, six to 12 weeks. So I found that motor uh, recovery is uh, the best. Okay, more questions? No time limit. As, as long as you have a question, we are here. Hello. Go ahead, Mohammed. Uh, uh, this is uh, Professor Mohammed Fahmi from Alexandria, Egypt. Actually, uh, uh, I have enjoyed this lecture very much, especially the discussion. Uh, mm -hmm. This one thing. Thank you very much for you. And second point, uh, I think. Uh, we, I have uh, a colleague, uh, his name is Ashraf Harafat. Uh, he is a professor also on faculty of medicine, Alexandria, Egypt. 
and also member of the society, Egyptian Society for Brain and the Skull. I think he is uh, joining today for the first time. Uh, this is my remark for this point at now. Thank you very much again. Welcome. Thank you so much. Welcome, sir. Okay, so uh, uh, if there are questions, fine. Otherwise, uh, you can post your questions uh, to me directly on my mail. Uh, as uh, in the past, I'll type my email ID so you can ask. And the next time, I hope I remember to answer professor's question regarding uh, carotid artery injury and how to manage it or what is the protocol. I'll come back with that. Uh, uh, sheesh, we're growing uh, because I think, you know, that people will get to know this technology and feel less shy uh, and be more interactive. It's just a, a time of learning and getting like a surgical instrument at first, you're maybe a little clumsy, but then you get uh, better and better at it. It's the same thing with this technology of interaction. You know, manipulating the mute button is difficult sometimes. Uh, so the biggest then, advantage which I think is that, you know, you can go back and listen to these lectures or the interaction. And, you yeah, know, yeah, it's great. Is important because, you know, it's, there are so many things that we don't understand when we listen to a le lecture for the first time or the technique. Uh, but when we sort of go back, it's like, you know, revision. And that's the, I, I personally feel that's the biggest advantage. Yeah, this is a good session. This was uh, not, not straight watching a video, uh, but, uh, you know, education is interaction, really. Uh, true education. So, so next week, uh, can we take up uh, uh, the, uh, the next part of this lecture, MIS approach for microvascular decompression? Sounds good. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Ashish. Thank you, Dr. Zayden and everyone else, Dr. Shah, Dr. Uh, Saeed, Radab. Uh, we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, bye -bye. sir. Thank you. Okay, bye -bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.